About 50 or 60,000 years ago, before the climax of the fourth glacial age, there lived a creature on Earth so like a man that until a few years ago its remains were considered to be altogether human. We have skulls and bones of it and a great accumulation of the large implements it made and used. It made fires. It sheltered in caves from the cold. It probably dressed skins roughly and wore them. It was right-handed as men are. Yet now the ethnologists tell us these creatures were not true men. They were of a different species of the same genus. They had heavy protruding jaws and great brow ridges above the eyes and very low foreheads. Their thumbs were not opposable to the fingers as men's are. Their necks were so poised that they could not turn back their heads and look up to the sky. They probably slouched along, head down and forward. Their chinless jaw bones resemble the Heidelberg jaw bone and are markedly unlike human jaw bones. And there were great differences from the human pattern in their teeth. Their cheek teeth were more complicated in structure than ours, more complicated and not less so. They had not the long fangs of our cheek teeth, and also these quasi-men had not the marked canines, dog teeth, of an ordinary human being. The capacity of their skulls was quite human, but the brain was bigger behind and lower in front than the human brain. Their intellectual faculties were differently arranged. They were not ancestral to the human line. Mentally and physically, they were upon a different line from the human line. Skulls and bones of this extinct species, of man, were found at Neanderthal, among other places, and from that place these strange proto-men have been christened Neanderthal men, or Neanderthalers. They must have endured in Europe for many hundreds or even thousands of years. At that time, the climate and geography of our world was very different from what they are at the present time. Europe, for example, was covered with ice, reaching as far south as the Thames and into central Germany and Russia. There was no channel separating Britain from France. The Mediterranean and the Red Sea were great valleys, which perhaps a chain of lakes in their deeper portions. And a great inland sea spread from the present Black Sea across South Russia and far into Central Asia. Spain, and all of Europe, not actually under ice, consisted of bleak uplands, under a harder climate than that of Labrador, and it was only when North Africa was reached that one would have found a temperate climate. Across the cold steppes of southern Europe, with its sparse arctic vegetation, drifted such hardy creatures as the woolly mammoth and woolly rhinoceros, great oxen and reindeer, no doubt following the vegetation northward in spring and southward in autumn. Such was the scene through which the Neanderthaler wandered, gathering such substance as he could, from small game or fruits and berries and roots. Possibly he was mainly a vegetarian, chewing twigs and roots. His level elaborate teeth suggest a largely vegetarian dietary. But we also find the long marrow bones of great animals in his caves, cracked to extract the marrow. His weapons could not have been of much avail in open conflict with great beasts, but it is supposed that he attacked them with spears at difficult river crossings and even constructed pitfalls for them. Possibly he followed the herds and preyed upon any dead that were killed in fights and perhaps he played the part of jackal to the saber-toothed tiger, which still survived in his day. Possibly, in the bitter hardships of the glacial ages, this creature had taken to attacking animals after long ages of vegetarian adaptation. We cannot guess what this Neanderthal man looked like. He may have been very hairy and very unhuman looking indeed. It is even doubtful if he went erect. He may have used his knuckles as well as his feet to hold himself up. 
Probably he went about alone or in small family groups. It is inferred from the structure of his jaw that he was incapable of speech as we understand it. For thousands of years, these Neanderthalers were the highest animals that the European area had ever seen. And then, some thirty or thirty-five thousand years ago, as the climate grew warmer, a race of kindred beings, more intelligent, knowing more, talking and cooperating together, came drifting into the Neanderthalers' world from the south. They ousted the Neanderthalers from their caves and squatting places. They hunted the same food. They probably made war upon their grisly predecessors and killed them off. These newcomers from the south or the east, for at present we do not know their region of origin, who at last drove the Neanderthalers out of existence altogether, were beings of our own blood and kin, the first two men. Their brain cases and thumbs and necks and teeth were anatomically the same as our own. In a cave at Cro-Magnon and in another at Grimaldi, a number of skeletons have been found, the earliest truly human remains that are so far known. So it is our race comes into the record of the rocks, and the story of mankind begins. The world was growing liker our own in those days, though the climate was still austere. The glaciers of the Ice Age were receding in Europe. The reindeer of France and Spain presently gave way to great herds of horses, as grass increased upon the steppes, and the mammoth became more and more rare in southern Europe, and finally receded northward altogether. We do not know where the true men first originated, but in the summer of 1921 an extremely interesting skull was found, together with pieces of a skeleton, at Broken Hill in South Africa which seems to be a relic of a third sort of man, intermediate in its characteristics between the Neanderthaler and the human being. The brain case indicates a brain bigger in front and smaller behind than the Neanderthalers, and the skull was poised erect upon the backbone in a quite human way. The teeth also and the bones are quite human. But the face must have been ape-like with enormous brow ridges and a ridge along the middle of the skull. The creature was indeed a true man, so to speak, with an ape-like Neanderthaler face. This Rhodesian man is evidently still closer to real men than the Neanderthal man. This Rhodesian skull is probably only the second of what in the end may prove to be a long list of finds of subhuman species which lived on the earth in the vast interval of time, between the beginnings of the Ice Age and the appearance of their common heir, and perhaps their common exterminator, the true man. The Rhodesian skull itself may not be very ancient. Up to the time of publishing this book there has been no exact determination of its probable age. It may be that this subhuman creature survived in South Africa until quite recent times. 